Chapter One. The beginning of things. They were not railway children at the beginning. They lived with their father and mother in London. There were three of them. Roberta, she was always called Bobby, and was the oldest. Next came Peter, who wanted to be an engineer when he grew up. And the youngest was Phyllis, who was always trying to be good. Mother was almost always at home, ready to play with the children, or to read to them. And she wrote stories, then read them to the children after tea. These three lucky children. Had everything that they needed: pretty clothes, a warm house, and lots of toys. They also had a wonderful father, who was never angry, and always ready to play a game. They were very happy, but they did not know how happy. Until their life in London was over, and they had to live a very different life indeed. The awful change came suddenly. It was Peter's birthday, and he was ten years old. Among his presents was a toy steam engine. And it quickly became Peter's favorite toy. But after three days, the engine went bang. Peter was very unhappy about his broken toy. The others said he cried, but Peter said his eyes were red because he had a cold. When father came home that day, Peter told him the sad story about his engine, and father looked at it very carefully. Mother and the children waited. Is there no hope? said Peter. Of course, there's hope, said father, smiling. I'll mend it on Saturday, and you can all help me. Just then, someone knocked at the front door. A few moments later, Ruth, the maid, came in. There are two gentlemen to see you, she said to father. Now, who can they be? said father. Try to be quick, dear," said his wife. "It's nearly time for the children to go to bed." But the two men stayed and stayed. Father's voice got louder and louder in the next room, but the children and mother could not hear what was said. Then Ruth came back. And spoke to mother. He wants you to go in, ma'am," she said. "I think he's had bad news. Be ready for the worst." Mother went into the next room, and there was more talking. Soon after, the children heard Ruth call a taxi. Then. There was the sound of feet going outside, and down the steps. Mother came back, and her face was white. It's time to go to bed, she said to the children. Ruth will take you upstairs. But father, began Phyllis. Fathers had to go away on business," said Mother. "Now, 
Go to bed, darlings. Bobby whispered, It wasn't bad news, was it? No, darling, said Mother. I can't tell you anything tonight. Please go now. Mother went out early the next morning, and it was nearly seven o'clock before she came home. She looked ill and tired, and the children asked her no questions. Mother drank a cup of tea. Then she said, Now, my darlings, I want to tell you something. Those men did bring bad news last night. Father will be away for some time, and I'm very worried. Is it something to do with the government? asked Bobby. The children knew that Father worked in a government office. Yes, said Mother. Now, don't ask me any more questions about it. Will you promise me that? The children promised. Everything was horrible for some weeks. Mother was nearly always out. Ruth, the maid, went away. Then Mother went to bed for two days, and the children wondered if the world was coming to an end. One morning, Mother came down to breakfast. Her face was very white, but she tried to smile. We have to leave our house in London, she said. We're going to live in the country, in a dear little white house near a railway line. I know you'll love it. A busy week followed, packing everything up in boxes. The children almost enjoyed the excitement. We can't take everything, Mother told them. Just the necessary things. We have to play being poor for a while. On their last night in the house, Peter had to sleep on the floor, which he enjoyed very much. I like moving, he said. I don't, said Mother, laughing. Bobby saw her face when she turned away. Oh, Mother, she thought, how brave you are. How I love you. Next day, they went to the railway station and got on a train. At first, they enjoyed looking out of the windows, but then they became sleepy. Later, Mother woke them. Wake up, dears, she said. We're there. There were no taxis, and a man with a cart took their boxes. The children and Mother walked behind the cart along a dark, dirty road, which seemed to go across the fields. After a while, a shape appeared in the darkness. There's the house, said Mother. The cart went along by the garden wall and round to the back door. There were no lights in any of the windows. Where's Mrs. Viney? said Mother. Who's she? asked Bobby. A woman from the village. I asked her to clean the place and make our supper, said Mother. Your train was late, 
said the man with the cart. She's probably gone home. But she has the key, said Mother. It'll be under the doorstep, said the man. He went to look. Yes, here it is. They went inside the dark house. There was a large kitchen with a stone floor. But there was no fire, and the room was cold. There was a candle on the table, and the man lit it. Then a noise seemed to come from inside the walls of the house. It sounded like small animals running up and down. Then the cart man went away. And shut the door. Immediately, the candle went out. Oh, I wish we hadn't come, said Phyllis. Chapter Two Peter and the Coal. You've often wanted something to happen, said Mother, lighting the candle again. And now it has. This is an adventure, isn't it? I told Mrs. Viney to leave our supper ready. I suppose she's put it in the other room. Let's go and see. They looked in the other room, but found no supper. What a horrible woman! said Mother. She's taken the money, but got us nothing to eat at all. Then we can't have any supper, said Phyllis unhappily. Yes, we can, said Mother. We can unpack one of the boxes. There's some food from the old house. They found candles in the box, and the girls lit them. Then Bobby fetched coal and wood, and lit a fire. It was a strange supper: tomatoes, potato chips, dried fruit. And cake, and they drank water out of teacups. After supper, they put sheets and blankets on the beds. Then Mother went to her own room. Very early next morning, Bobby pulled Phyllis's hair to wake her. "Wake up," she said. We're in the new house, don't you remember? They wanted to surprise their mother, and get the breakfast ready. But first, they went to look outside. The house seemed to stand in a field, near the top of a hill, and they could see a long way. This place is much prettier than our house in London," said Phyllis. They saw the railway line at the bottom of the hill, and the big black opening of a tunnel. Further away, they could see a high bridge between the hills, but the station was too far away to see. Let's go and look at the railway," said Peter. "Perhaps there are trains passing. We can see them from here," said Bobby. So they sat down on a big, flat, comfortable stone in the grass. And when Mother 
came to look for them at eight o'clock, they were asleep in the sun. I found another room, Mother told them. The door is in the kitchen. Last night, we thought it was a cupboard. There was a table in the little square room, and on the table was their supper. There's a letter from Mrs. Viney, explained Mother. Her son broke his arm, and she went home early. She's coming again later this morning. Cold meat and apple pie for breakfast, laughed Peter. How funny! But their supper made a wonderful breakfast. All day, they helped Mother to unpack and arrange everything in the rooms. It was late in the afternoon when she said, "That's enough work for today. I'll go and lie down for an hour before supper." The children looked at each other. Where shall we go? Said Bobby, although she already knew the answer. To the railway, of course! Cried Peter. At the bottom of the hill, there was a wooden fence, and there was the railway, with its shining lines, telegraph wires, and posts, and signals. They all climbed onto the top of the fence. Suddenly, they heard a noise, which grew louder every second. They looked along the line, towards the dark opening of the tunnel. The next moment, the railway lines began to shake, and a train. Came screaming out of the tunnel. Oh," said Bobby, when it had gone. "It was like a great wild animal going by. It was very exciting," said Peter. "I wonder if it was going to London," said Bobby. "London." Is where father is. Let's go down to the station and find out," said Peter. They walked along the edge of the line, beneath the telegraph wires, to the station. They went up onto the platform, and took a quick look into the porter's room. Inside, the porter. Was half asleep behind a newspaper. There were a great many railway lines at the station. On one side of the big station yard, was a large heap of coal, which the steam trains used for their engines. There was a white line on the wall behind, near the top of the heap. Later, when the porter came out onto the platform, Peter asked about the white line. "It's to show how much coal there is in the heap," said the porter. "So we shall know if anybody steals some." The porter was smiling, and Peter thought he was a nice, friendly person. And so the days passed. The children did not go to school now, and Mother spent every day in her room, writing stories. Sometimes, she managed to sell a story to a magazine, and then there were cakes for tea. 
The children did not forget their father, but they did not talk about him much, because they knew that mother was unhappy. Several times, she had told them that they were poor now. But it was difficult to believe this, because there was always enough to eat, and they wore the same nice clothes. But then, there were three wet days, when the rain came down, and it was very cold. Can we light a fire? Asked Bobby. We can't have fires in June. Said mother, coal is very expensive. After tea, Peter told his sisters, "I have an idea. I'll tell you about it later, when I know if it's a good one." And two nights later, Peter said to the girls, "Come and help me." On the hill, just above the station, there were some big stones in the grass. Between the stones, the girls saw a small heap of coal. "I found it," said Peter. "Help me carry it up to the house." After three journeys up the hill. The coal was added to the heap by the back door of the house. The children told nobody. A week later, Mrs. Viney looked at the heap by the back door and said, "There's more coal here than I thought there was." The children laughed silently, and said nothing. But then came the awful night, when the station master was waiting for Peter in the station yard. He watched Peter climb onto the large heap of coal by the wall, and start to fill a bag. Now I've caught you, you young thief! Shouted the station master. And he took hold of Peter's coat. I'm not a thief," said Peter. But he did not sound very sure about it. "You're coming with me to the station," said the station master. "Oh no!" cried a voice from the darkness. "Not." The police station," cried another voice. "No, the railway station," said the man, surprised to hear more voices. "How many of you are there?" Bobby and Phyllis stepped out of the darkness. "We did it too." Bobby told the station master, "We helped carry the coal away, and we knew where Peter was getting it." "No, you didn't," said Peter angrily. "It was my idea." "We did know," said Bobby. "We pretended we didn't, but we did." The station master looked at them. "You're from the White House on the hill," he said. "Why are you stealing coal?" "I didn't think it was stealing," said Peter. "There's so much coal here. I took some from the middle of the heap, and I, I thought." Nobody would mind, and Mother says we're too poor to have a fire. But there were all 
always fires at our other house, and don't. Bobby whispered to Peter. There was a silence, and the station master thought for a minute. Then he said to Peter, "I won't do anything this time, but remember, this coal belongs to the railway, and even from the middle of the heap, it's still stealing." And the children knew he was right.